I was only given a couple of minutes. I could stand up here and talk about this trip for hours and hours. So I just want to start off by saying thank you for everyone who made this possible. Thank you for those who prayed for this trip. Thank you for those who, you know, scoured all of Baldwin County and bought them out of crayons. I hope you can see those on the pictures that came in and put together all those packets that we that we were able to put together so the kids would have stuff and crafts to do while they were there. Those who helped financially, all those things that everyone that made 
cheapest trip possible. I, as you see, we're able to do a lot of things. Um, a lot of those things that the church actually paid for through Harvest Sunday. So the setting up of the computer labs and as well as um, the uh, the painting of those rooms and things like that. Also, we did, we're able to do a lot of projects for some of the individual members of the congregation as well. So I just wanted to ask them for the opportunity to stand up here and to thank you very much for all that you've done um, that has blessed that has blessed the, um, the country of Jamaica. And I wish that you would think about this and start praying about this, but also make a plan to go with us next year. Um, we were able to visit 17 schools, but there were so many more opportunities. We just need more people. That's really, that's really what we need. We need people on the ground willing to go and love these children, to teach these children, to spend some time with these children, and the opportunities are endless. There's our schools begging us to come and be with them, but we need you. We need some more help. We need some more people there on the ground. So, um, I ask you to think about that, start praying about that, and start marking your calendar for next year. So we'll turn the worship back over.
Good morning. Today's scripture reading will be coming from Psalm chapter 30, verses 4 through 5. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in with the morning.
please pray with me. Our Father, which art in heaven, we are so blessed in this country to be able to come to church and worship you and sing, sing songs and praise you. And dear Lord, we are just so thankful that you love us and that Christ was sacrificed for our sins, that, that we may have eternal life. Dear Lord, we, we just thank you for our health. We know that there are so many out there that are, are suffering from physical physical illnesses and, and spiritual illnesses and our country uh, needs you more than ever. And dear Lord, we pray that, uh, that, that we can continue to be good examples, that we continue to support uh, the, the cause of Christ in this, in this, dark, uh, this dark time. We just pray that, that we can not only be available for everyone else, we can be available for each other. Dear Lord, we pray that you will accept this worship service, that it's, uh, it's, it's worthy and, and that, that our minds are clear and our, our minds are open, our hearts are open for your word and, and what you have to share with us today. And we thank you for the leaders of this church. pray that you'll be with them. We also pray for the leaders of our country, our state, and our cities, and our towns, that you'll be with them as well, that, that, uh, that in all things that they choose to do right. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for Christ. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
as we all know, tomorrow is the 4th of July. And when you think of that date, what are some things or images that come to your mind? You know, for many of us, it'll be cooking out. Uh, it'll be a day off work. It might be the fireworks that you go and see uh, tomorrow night. Those are things that we associate with the 4th of July. But I think like many of our holidays, the thought behind that has, lost, has been lost to a lot of people. You know, certain holidays now are the beginning of summer or the end of summer or a day that we collect Easter eggs or give gifts. But uh, the 4th of July is our Independence Day. And we lose that thought many times in celebrating. It's our independence from a government that didn't let us have our own path, that was oppressive, tyrannical, authoritarian. We declared that independence and we celebrate that every year. And this morning I'll ask the same question in regard to the Lord's Supper. What do you think about and associate with the Lord's Supper? Eating this bread, drinking this cup. For many of us, it's just something we do every week. Uh, we think about the death of Christ. We think about the cross. And those are good things. I'm not saying we shouldn't observe that. But do you ever think about the Lord's Supper in regard to independence and freedom and glory and what will come. I want to read just a few passages this morning. Uh, they'll be from four different parts of the, of the New Testament, but it addresses this idea of freedom. And that's what I'd like for us to think about this morning as we, we share in this, this together. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life and has set us free from the law of sin and death. You have been set free from sin. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Let's think about the freedom that we enjoy in Christ. When we committed ourselves to Christ, put on Christ in baptism, died to our old selves, and were raised again, Paul says in Romans 6, 7, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Let's give thanks as we partake. Father God, we are so thankful this morning that we can share in this bread and, and cup that help us to remember physical symbols that represent such a, a great, great spiritual truth that in the, in the body and blood of our Savior Jesus, he has paid the price. He has set us free from our sins. We no longer bear that penalty, but because of his sacrifice for us, we know that we have redemption, we have forgiveness, we are declared righteous in your sight. And as we eat this bread this morning, help us to remember the cost of that sacrifice, the life of Jesus on that cross, but help us to celebrate and lift you up for the, for the love that you have for us and allowing that sacrifice to take place for our benefit. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen.
John tells us in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, to him, Jesus, who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Let's give thanks. Fathers, we share this cup this morning. We realize that if it were not for the blood of Jesus, continually cleansing us, making us pure, making us right before you, that we would be dead in our sins. But because of our belief and our faith in Christ, we know that we have the forgiveness, the washing, the cleansing of that blood every single day. Help us not forget that. Help us to celebrate that this morning. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. I know we all can maybe relate to that uh, day of independence when we uh, put our trust and faith in Jesus, but there's going to be another day of independence. And I want to read just a couple of past, uh, verses from Romans chapter 8 as we uh, finish our thoughts this morning on, on the, the uh, communion. Paul says in chapter 8, verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. Verse 21, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Verse 23, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. There will be a day when Jesus returns. We will be redeemed. We will be liberated. We will be freed. And I can imagine what that day is going to be like. It's, it's really unimaginable. And when you think about the fireworks that you see tomorrow night, just think about how big that fireworks display is going to be when Jesus comes back. What a glorious day that's going to be that we get to celebrate together as believers in him. We also take this as an opportunity to remember our blessings, how much God has given us in a material sense, and that uh, we have the opportunity now to share to give back and to uh, show our love for others by our giving so that uh, we can continue the work of this, this congregation and uh, many other works that uh, we're all involved in. Let's give God thanks at this time. Father, we thank you. Uh, our, our, just, our words are so inconsequential, really, of what you have done for us. And we just are so blessed and help us to see that blessing more clearly each day. And we know that when we see that blessing that you've given us, we will be more willing and uh, motivated to, to return to others and share with others as you have given to us. Thank you for the opportunity to give so that we can express our love to you, but also express our love to others. It's in Christ we pray. Amen.
Be seated, please. This morning, we're going to continue in our series we're called Assured. We're going to be in 1 John in chapter 3. If you want to go ahead and open your Bibles there, you can follow along on the screens if you'd like. But what we're going to see today in 1 John chapter 3 is G, uh, John is going to describe for us one of the indicators of a real Christian is those that join Jesus in his mission to search and destroy. The Bible does not describe sin as merely a series of mistakes that we make. But when the Bible talks about sin, it talks about the power of sin. It talks about the dominion of sin. It talks about the idea of how that sin can rule and reign in our lives. But in our text today, John is going to point out that sin is of the devil. And those that practice sin are of the devil. If a sin is a power, then it needs to be broken. If sin is a master, then we need to be freed from that master. If sin is the work of Satan, then those works need to be destroyed. And that's what Jesus came to do. And that's what Jesus did. He was born into this world to destroy sin, the root cause of that sin, and that's Satan himself. Here in 1 John chapter 3 we read, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Now last week we saw the idea that the story of God's plan was to live in eternal fellowship with his created children. But early on we see where Satan showed up and tried to derail that plan by tempting man to sever his relationship with God. And this raised a tension. What would God do? Would he just abandon the plan? Or would he do something? And the answer comes in God sending Jesus to reconcile the broken fellowship that man had with him. Now, in our text, you notice the word appeared appears a couple of times. Now, last week, John used that word to talk about the return of Jesus. In our text today, John is using that word to talk about the birth of Jesus. In verse 5, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. In verse 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, and the devil has seen, been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. This is a cause of great joy because we were created to live in righteousness, indwelled by God, and to have fellowship with God. We were not made to sin. Sin's like putting sand in a gas tank. It's, it's like uh, uh, putting cancer in the body. It's like breathing carbon monoxide instead of breathing fresh air. Peter put it like this, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. 
Jesus didn't just come here to tell us that we were bad people and we needed to do better. He didn't come here to primarily tell us that we need to just stop sinning. He didn't come here to condemn us as sinners. The law would do that. Jesus came here to liberate us from sin by going to the root problem of sin, and that's Satan itself. He came here to sever our ties with the kingdom of darkness and to bring us into a reunion with himself so that that might lead to righteousness because Jesus himself is righteousness. Now, here's why that's so important. The world that we live in today is much like the world that John was in in the sense of the culture. And what culture says, which is basically this, it doesn't matter what you do in the flesh as long as you have some nice, good thoughts about God in your heart. And John would tell us that let no one lead you astray thinking that you can be right with God while doing the things that God would say are wrong. How can a real Christian enjoy what God sent Jesus to destroy. Maybe you heard the story about the guy who always got up and always said, prayed the same prayer. Lord, just remove the cobwebs from our lives. And finally, someone jumped in and said, Lord, why don't you just kill the spider? You see, that's what John is saying the mission was, to destroy, not tolerate, but to destroy the works of Satan. And what I want to begin with today is to look at a couple of the moves that God made in this brilliant plan to bring about this reconciliation. The first was this, Jesus' birth. Several years ago, there was an amazing story about a six-year-old little girl in New York who had and been diagnosed with a tumor that existed uh, and had connected itself to some of the organs around her stomach area. Her parents had been to doctors everywhere, and all of them gave them the same answer. There was basically nothing that could be done. It was inoperable. There was no way to get to the tumor. But at last, her parents, who would not give up on that answer, found a doctor Presbyterian Children's Hospital, who was willing to attempt the surgery. They did a surgery on this little girl that took 23 hours. They basically removed all of her organs from her body and set them outside of her body so that they could get to that tumor and they could remove that cancer and take it away, putting all the organs back in when they had finished with that. Five days later, that little girl walked out of the hospital. You see, Here's the dilemma. Man became infected with the cancer of sin. And how would God get to the tumor? How would a holy God get to that sin? And the answer came in the form of a man, a manger. Only as a man could Jesus take my place. But he could only take that place as a sinless man. And so in verse 5, John says, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. You see, you couldn't take my place because the law has a claim against you. And I couldn't take your place because the law has a claim against me. And so Jesus came to satisfy the demands of the law against himself so that he could satisfy the demands against you and me. And Paul would say, for our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And that's why several times John would say, don't let anyone tell you that Jesus did not come in the flesh. Because you remember there was a, a popular philosophy of that day that basically said that all matter is evil that only the Spirit is good. So there was no way possible that God could ever come in the flesh because that would mean that God was evil. And John says, don't listen to that. Jesus appeared as a man. Jesus died as a man in order that he might destroy 
the works of Satan. You see, if we give up on the incarnation of God and Jesus in the flesh, then what we have done is this. We have given up on God's way to the cancer. Now, in order to destroy the work of Satan, Jesus had to destroy his greatest weapon to terrorize man, and that was death itself. In Hebrews 2, it says, Since therefore the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to a lifelong slavery. The first move of God in this brilliant plan was the birth of Jesus. But the second move was our new birth. Even though Jesus has nailed the sins to the cross, it doesn't change the fact that we still have this natural part of our flesh that gravitates towards sin. And here's what I think John is telling us this. Unregenerated man cannot say no to the devil, but a new creation can. And so over and over again, what we see in that first century are people who are willing to be baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, that's what baptism is. Baptism is God's way of saying to unregenerated man, that you don't need to modify your flesh, you need to crucify it. In Romans chapter 6, we read, How can we who died to sin live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in a newness of life. You see, the gospel is not just the good news that you have been forgiven of your sin, but it's also the good news that God now has given you the power of the Holy Spirit that's in your life and helped you to break the strongholds that Satan might have in your life. Those strongholds of sin can now be destroyed. In verse 9 of our text, John said, No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. God's seed, that's the new nature of God. That's the Holy Spirit. And the whole plan and purpose of this new birth is to destroy sin. God working in you that this new birth through that power and through the power of the Holy Spirit can now work so that sin no longer reigns in our life. Sin no longer has that power in our life. It no longer has that dominion in our life. When Jesus comes in, the darkness goes out. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can now live a changed life. We can now have this new radical transformed life within us because there's this internal pressure that's now in our hearts, that moves us towards holiness and righteousness. Now, please understand this. We can still fall. We can still make mistakes. We can still sin. But the difference is this. There's now the bend in our life to move towards righteousness and love. I like how one author put it. It is this new nature from God that gives the Christian the desire, the leaning, the propensity to live a holy life. A Christian cannot sin without a struggle or without a sense of grief so powerful that ultimately, despite his struggles, he'll be brought to repentance and a forsaking of sin. Sin is no longer natural to the believer. Look, external pressure can't destroy sin. External pressure can't destroy the work of Satan. If it could, we would have already passed enough laws. We'd already built enough schools. We would have already done enough to fix the world. None of us can grit our teeth and try harder to defeat the sinful nature. External power cannot defeat sin, but internal power can. And we have this internal power in us through the power of God's Spirit to let us know that we're not fighting this thing by ourselves. We're not trying to obtain and arrive at righteousness on our own. There is a work of Jesus Christ that's going on inside of each one of us. 
Yes, we must choose to follow. Yes, we must choose to obey. No, we're not just a bunch of ro robots. But all of this is happening. This overwhelmingly powerful grace of God that equips us, it teaches us, and it empowers us. So the, so the beautiful, brilliant plan of God began with two moves. The first move was the birth of Jesus. And the second move is our rebirth. But because of that, I want to leave you with this. There's a couple of challenges that comes from all of this. The take home for today is this. The challenge that we must surrender the right to govern to God. Look at verse 4 again. John said, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Well, what is he talking about here? Sin is lawlessness. It's just not the fact that I, I, I do a few, few things that are wrong. Or, or it's not just behavior. It goes deeper than that. It goes to attitude. Lawlessness is rebellion against God's rightful position to rule and to reign in my life. You see, sin in essence is this, a rejection of the authority of God. Isn't that what happened in the garden? Isn't that really what took place in the garden? That man threw off God's right to call the shots. God's right to tell man how he was supposed to live. You know why there's so many fights and wars and divorces? Because there's about six billion kingdoms out there that are fighting for sovereignty. And Jesus said this, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The idea is this, Jesus says there's good news, but we have to repent. And here's what I think he means by the idea of repentance here. The idea that we have to surrender our will to the will of God. We have to allow God to rule and reign in our life. Sin no longer gets to call the shots. God is the one who calls the shots in my life. And the second challenge is this, that we must consider areas where holiness is stunted. Again, it doesn't mean that we won't ever make a mistake. But what we have to do is look for those habitual areas in our lives where we push holiness out, where we set God aside, where we say, you know what, this is my life and this is what I want to do. And so we have to look for those areas where holiness is stunted. Sin might be an, an abnormal moment of defeat in our life, but it can never become a normal part of our life. To do otherwise is to make a mockery of the cross. Again, in Romans chapter 6, Paul said, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey is passions. We've got to remember something. Jesus has disarmed the enemy. Jesus has opened the door to the prison cell. We no longer have to be chained to sin. We no longer have to be held in that prison any longer. And Jesus would even ask, why are you doing that? Why are you allowing that to happen? Because that power has been broken. That power that Satan once had over us. And the only power that's left, the only thing he's got left is deception to deceive us. So it's time. It's time to stop making excuses. It's time to start making progress in looking and living more like Jesus Christ. So we close this morning. I hope that perhaps we can do a little search and destroy in our lives. Maybe it's time for us just to take a moment and do that, to think about those areas in our life, those areas where we really struggle. Maybe we struggle with anger. Maybe we struggle with a temper. Maybe we struggle with forgiving people. Maybe we struggle with our tongue. Maybe we struggle with lust. 
we all have those areas. We're about to sing a song of, of encouragement today. If you need to be baptized into Christ, we'd love to assist you with that. If you need prayers of encouragement, prayers of strength, we would love to encourage you with that too. There are elders in the back and I'll be down front. But here's what I want you to understand. Jesus is not encouraging you to turn over a new leaf. Jesus is inviting you to a new life. So ask yourself, where is it that I need to search and destroy in my life? God did not call us to live under the dominion and the power of Satan. He called us to live in the righteousness and the love of Jesus Christ. We have a power to break those strongholds. We need to take advantage of that. We need to live in that freedom that Rick talked about this morning at the table. That's what he died for. That's what he put his body on the cross for. That's what he shed his blood for. Where is it in my life that I need to start searching and destroy? And while you decide, let's stand and sing. Everyone needs protection, but let them fail me. Let mercy fall upon me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior, the hope of nations. Save that we have with one another and Lord as we depart from here help us um, to take
take the two challenges that Rick has put before us, before us, and um, to find those things in our lives that um, keep us from follow, following you, to search those things out, Lord, and to destroy those things. Help us to live that new life that you've promised with us in Christ Jesus. Lord, we love you and pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Yeah.